whatever was an appropriate time, and I just don't care anymore. But um, my um, sister-in-law is an amazing person, and she runs a cross-stitch shop in Topeka. And um, some of you have seen this, but she hasn't. I know that. I saw it wrapped up. I didn't know what it was, and I tried to be very careful with it. Well, that was so nice of you. It. That was nice of you. Ooh. Ooh. Ah. Ooh. 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 He hasn't seen Ooh. Ooh. yet, right? No. Okay. This is yours. Ooh. Yowza. <laughs> that worked too. Pretty. Yay. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so, that's good that we didn't crush it with the box. It's good that yes, we didn't it crush is. it. Yeah, that's good. So we'll leave it setting up here so people can see. Super. It's My, beautiful. Uh, yeah. And My, it's mine. And it's yours. And it goes on your wall in Florida. Right. Goes, and it yeah. will. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She has an empty place in her office, so I thought that would work. Um, and, and for anyone who's interested, my sister-in-law said, you can ask, um, um, but she said duplicating it would be at retail, not at sister-in-law rates, you understand. Right. <laughs> would be about $135. So anyone that's interested, I have her address. Does that she have a very a, fine cross stitch? Does she have a pattern? Yes, yes. yes. Well, the pattern, pattern. The pattern you can buy for typical pattern rates. Um, the sunflower seed in Topeka. Catch her online. Okay. And the pattern is available, along with the list of of what um, yarn, yarn and things. She it's uses, probably so. thread. Yeah. Whatever the stitchery stuff. The, the notion. That's a good word. Okay, now we're back to David? Now we're back to David, but I've been wanting, every time I thought of giving it, well, I got distracted, so. Anyway. That's amazing, you're so hard to distract. <laughs> Shiny. Anybody can, anybody can stitch one. Who is she talking? <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know. Or hopefully out of the... We want to be kind to one another, we do. don't we? We do. She said in her school mom voice. Oh, okay. oh, as if I'm not hard to distract, I'm on the camera saying, oh, is shiny. someone talking? Oh, is <laughs> someone? Who's <laughs> shiny? How many times this morning did I attack you on your shoulder? Three, only three. I did pretty good, and she was pacing. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Virginia, there's some parts of your talk where there's wall. you focused on an empty chair, and you hear your voice. That's all right. Okay, music of the ring. Essentially the ring of fire that went back to 1631 Germany from the year 2000. If little small West Virginia town goes back in time, they take their CDs, they take their eight tracks, they take their records, they take whatever else with them to a time MP3 which did players. not own a piano because they hadn't been invented yet. And what various other no guitars. No guitars. No modern. They, I thought no modern guitars. No modern guitars. We'll they had loops and we'll they had so we had a guitars. lot of people, including Gorgon myself, write stories about what the downtimers would be impressed by in music. However, our expert here is David Carrico, and his presentation begins now. Okay. Come on in. Stand up for a few minutes because I'm going to need the wall as a prop. Okay. Um, First of all, the Usually disclaimers. People come in at one time. My bachelor's degree is in music theory and composition, which is the study of how music is put together and how it flows from one, you know, from beginning to end. It is. I am not a musicologist, which is the study of the history of music and the history of the forms of music. But anybody who majors in music spends at least two semesters in a class called music history, where they drill this stuff into you anyway so that you walk out with at least a nodding acquaintance of it, including the famed music history listening exams where they would bring an arm full of LPs in my generation, LPs into the classroom, put the record on the on the uh, player. turntable, drop the needle on the record at a random spot, play it for five seconds, and you had to write down who wrote it and what the piece was. So that that's kind of the background I'm coming from. What grade did you get in that class? Uh, you passed. I think I had a B in one semester and an A in the other one. Jesus. Let's, let's, well, let's disclaim his disclaimer, though. Let's see. 
the head radio guy is a computer programmer, the animals and livestock specialist is an electronics engineer, the economist is an autodidact. The, the chocolate the, expert the chocolate is an English expert. teacher. There you go. I mean, so, you know, David in our group is overqualified for professional credits with the exception of Virginia. So, there you go. In, in, anyway, uh, secondly, this is not going to be a comprehensive study of world music. This isn't even going to be a comprehensive study of West Euro European music. This is going to be a sampler of, first of all, what does the downtime music sound like? What do the people of the time, what are they used to listening to? And then we're going to look at the music that the uptimers bring with them and try to do an A-B type comparison between the shots of each side so that you get a you get at least a taste of the conflict yeah the, the, the conflict exactly the conflict but before we get to that part of it I did a presentation what four years ago six years ago in Tulsa for it was five yeah whatever there Tulsa, are Albany, there seven. really is a geeky side to music yeah, there really is a scientific side of music and, and that deals with the science of acoustics because music is an oral thing. You hear it, and it's based on vibrations in the air. All sound is based on vibrations in the air. And when you study acoustics, if you think of a piano keyboard, if this is middle C, that has a particular um, vibration hertz rate. Yeah, vibration number. You know, whatever it is. Frequency. Frequency, Frequency that's Frequency. the word. When you move up the keyboard to the next C, the frequency of that C is exactly twice the frequency of the lower octave. And that 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 interval is called an octave. Because there so, are eight of what yeah, we recognize in between. So this is, yeah, if the, and I'm making the number up because I don't have my notes with me, but if, if this is 350, this would be 700. Okay. Now, so, and every note in between those has an exact frequency. How you tune the notes of the octave is flexible. And in that period of time, they were literally having flame wars over how to tune the notes. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that organs, once you, once you tune an organ, you're pretty well locked in. You can retune a note on an organ, but you can't retune it much. And once you've tuned that organ, you've pretty well locked in the, the, the harmonic structure of that instrument and any other instruments, any other music that's going to happen with that organ. The problem is when I tune from C to G, the best resonance, the best harmonic value, the best locked-in sound has one particular ratio. But if I tune from E to G, when I tune from C to G to get the best sound, it may be, if this is 350, it might be 380. If I tune from E to G, to get the best sound, to get the best harmony, it might be 377. Right. <coughs> and they were so fixated on getting the best sound that a keyboard instrument would tune well for one key, for one tonality, and then as you moved away from that tonality, if, if I tune my piano to sound great in C, to sound perfect in the key of C, and then I started playing something in the key of A flat. Because of the harmonic differences, it wouldn't sound as good. And there were different methodologies, there were different schools of thought about how these tunings should be done, how these tonalities should be crafted. But they all had one common drawback. Once you tune the instrument for one particular tonality, 
there are going to be keys that are going to be flatly unplayable because the intervals between some of the notes just won't sound good. So there were fl literally flame wars for hundreds of years between different musicians, different uh, theoreticians, different philosophers even. Composers, everybody. Over what was the best tuning method. And you know, I, I could throw a few, you know, the Pythagorean method, the, uh, the well-tempered method, the just method. Uh, there were others. So what's going to happen when somebody comes out of the middle school or high school science room with a set of tuning forks? We're, we're headed that direction. Oh. Is, <coughs> is this where you get like a, a tenor um, recorder or a, a, a soprano recorder? They're, they're in different keys. They're, you know, you, one is a G and one is a C. That's a just different problem. Different because different it's a different size. It different comes issue, in a different. That, that has nothing to do with tonality. I just wondered because I've had to deal with that. That, that. that deals with the fundamental tone of the instrument. Of one that instrument. That has nothing to do with tonality and tuning. But this went on. Those flame wars went on for another several hundred. Oh yeah. Years. In, in our time, I mean, these flame wars started like in the 1400s. When they started writing, when, when they when they finally started moving out of the idea of modes and right. started moving into the idea of major and minor keys, right, right, they started they started doing that in the 1400s, and that's that's when the flame wars about tonality and tuning really started, and they didn't get resolved until the late 1800s. When you say modes, are you talking about like the mixolydian? Yes, yes, yeah. Aeolian, mixolydian. Yeah. <coughs> Church modes, whatever, whatever you want to call them, but those modes, yes. I'm personally musically challenged. Um, <laughs> deeply, deeply musically challenged. What's a key? Okay. Piano keyboard. Middle C. You got that? <coughs> if you take middle C and you, you play the white keys from this middle C to the next C, you've played an octave and you have played a major scale. In the key of? In the key of C. C. C would be, C would be considered the fundamental tone of the key the and all of the harmonies in some way or another build on or relate to that C and the chords that can be built on that C. C is the home base. Moving up and down where the start is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the difference between modes and major and minor keys is the difference of the pattern of, of what's called the half step. Because if you look at a piano keyboard, from C to D, white key to white key, is a whole step because there's a black key in between them. From D to E is a whole step because there's a black key in between them. From E to F is only a half step because there's no black key. So when you look at a piano keyboard, from key to key to key to key is from Some of them key have to adjacent key is a half step. But to make a, an octave scale, you're going to build on whole steps. And half steps. And half steps. So, <coughs> flame wars. This did not stabilize until the 1850s. That's the German musicians pretty well decided around 1850 plus or minus that major minor keys in what they called an equal temperament methodology was what was going to, what was going to work. Be the standard. And the rest of the European musicians kind of fell into line 